Welcome back to the Banderpod, the verdant and verbose podcast of Bandersnatch Books. We are a small press publisher of treasures found off the beaten path for lovers of all that is good, true, and beautiful. I'm Carrie Givens, and today I'm talking with Rachel Donahue and Annie Beth Donahue about your questions. So we put out a call on social media, and we had no idea what questions we would get. We didn't know if we would be getting questions from readers saying, so why did people do this in the plot? Or uh, if we would get questions about the publishing process or what. And we got all of them, kind of. So I'm going to start with some more general interest questions that we received. And the first one is one that, Annie Beth, I'm not sure you're ready for. It is, what were each of your favorite books when you were kids? So I can answer now. Oh, Oh, great. Go ahead, Annie Beth. So the reason that I didn't have an answer for this question is because I like lots of books. But if we go way back, my favorite books were comic books. I had a lot a very large Archie comic book collection. Mm. I had a lot of Garfield. I had Calvin and Hobbes. As I got older, I had Foxtrot, which was really probably one of my ultimate faves. And then, of course, Agatha Christie. Mm. When did you start reading Agatha Christie? Do you remember? I do. I was in, well, I was definitely in fifth grade. I may have been in fourth grade. Yeah, that's probably about when I started as well. That's really yeah. fun. The ones that stand out from my childhood are the Little House on the Prairie series. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. the series that was written by Laura Ingalls Wilder's daughter, Rose Wilder. She has a whole series of books as well. And I was, I read all of, all of them. Nancy Drew series Mm -hmm. was a really big one when I was a kid. Love the Nancy Drew mysteries and Shel Silverstein. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, I think that's mine. I, and I've talked about this before, but I was not a huge reader until I hit fourth grade. But my breakthrough books were the first three of the Anne of Green Gables series. Hmm. Part of the reason that I you know, became a reader was we moved to Hong Kong and there wasn't much TV. Um, mm-hmm. There were only two English channels and one of them was the BBC News. So I wasn't watching that one. And the other one was whatever American series they had purchased that week. <laughs> so I started reading books and the apartment that we were subletting had those three Anne books as a, as a box set and started loving Anne. So that's, Mm. that's definitely a huge one. And I read tons of Ellen Montgomery throughout middle school. Mm. Another one that I remember reading that year that stuck with me is called the key. Um, It's C A Y. Yeah. And it's, it's a historical fiction. A boy, Dutch boy is uh, shipwrecked in in the Caribbean on an island during World War II. Like they're trying to get back to the Netherlands. <clears throat> it's it's an amazing book. And then like Tuck Everlasting was another one that I loved mm. that year. Yeah, there's a lot of books that are really formative that I know that I read in fourth grade. <laughs> um, <laughs> did, did you all read Charlotte Sometimes? No. No. I've never heard of it. This is actually one of my favorite books. It was a girl who, I think she was at boarding school. It may have been a hospital. It was something. So she was sleeping in a bed and like, sometimes she would wake up in another time period. Mm. Oh. Like, that was really fun to me. Yeah. I think it was the time travel aspect, but it was called Charlotte sometimes because sometimes she was Charlotte herself and sometimes she was maybe this other girl. Oh, that's so fun. How interesting. One other series that I adored and I read for the first time in fifth grade was the Bruno and Boots books, which are by Gordon Corman. They're also called the McDonald Hall books. And it's a boys boarding school. And Bruno always gets everybody, you know, has a harebrained idea and gets everybody involved in whatever adventure he is about to have. And they are absolutely delightful. I love Gordon Corman. So anyway, we could talk about books all day. Um, yes. <laughs> so we, we will move on to the next question, which is what are your favorite allegorical fiction pieces? Oh, so how do we define allegorical fiction? I think you get to define it as how your own heart mm. feels. I have really enjoyed the Little Pilgrim's Progress book, mm-hmm. the new one that's illustrated. I really enjoyed that version much more than the original. 
<laughs> the original is hard to it's it, it was a bit through. of a slog for all yeah. of us and but we little, made it through little pilgrim's progress as joe sutphin illustrations yes so and joe sutphin does an amazing job uh illustrating the whole thing so we enjoyed that one a lot um it's not really allegory but i'm gonna i'm gonna pull you out here carrie and say the king's messenger was one of my favorite it's not pure allegory but it's such a beautiful picture of like the spiritual life, but it's set concretely in this world, this kingdom. We always describe it more as parable-ish more than allegory, but I I love that story. I'll take that. I'll take mm-hmm. that. I heard someone call it allegory-ish. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, if we get to include that one, then that's probably my favorite, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> King's Messenger. It should be. It should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and King's Messenger is a book that I wrote over the course of many years. And it was one that each one of Smuggin's adventures is tied to something I was learning in mm. my own walk. Mm-hmm. I do think that there is there are definitely allegorical elements in it. Yeah. It's a good one. And you can buy that from Bandersnatch Books, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to throw that out there. Nice, nice. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So this says, keeping in mind your good, true, and beautiful mission, what is something you look for in the protagonists of the novels that you publish? Mm. I will say the message of the good and the beautiful is lost if the true part is missing. For me personally, that's probably the thing I look for the most. Yeah, I think a character who's authentic, Mm. who's really wrestling with real world problems or if it's a a romance it deals with the the real complexity of relationship Mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the reasons I have have enjoyed Lauren's trilogy the daughter of Arden trilogy so much because her characters they're complex and they're they're layers there and so Mm -hmm. I think that's something I appreciate when I'm reading yeah Yeah. So I read A Place to Hang the Moon Mm. just this last year. And the thing I have said about it to everybody since I read it is I cannot remember a book that I wanted so much good for every single character, Mm. not just my protagonists, but even the, you know, quote, villains of the story. I wanted the best for them. I wanted them to be redeemed And I think that is something I've found in in the books that we have picked up. It's characters that I want good for, Mm. you know, and and I think looking forward, we've got Mari and the Margins coming out Mm. um, soon. And that's one of the things that drew me to Mari from the get go was I just wanted so much good for her as a character. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, I don't know exactly, you know, what qualities of the character that means, because I think it can happen for very, very different kinds of characters. But being yeah. able to place them in a story and present them to me in such a way that I want their good, mm. that really draws me in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So last question, which is, again, sort of halfway between interests and Bandersnatch policy. Are you looking to mainly publish series or are you open to standalones? I think, I mean, quick answer, both. Yeah, both. (laughs) All right, so let's move into how we do things. This question I thought was really interesting. When you were setting up your publishing company, how did you figure out the logistical details, like who your printer would be, prices, illustration, cover artists, et cetera? Is there anything you wish you had done differently at the start? And then there's a follow-up or a second question that says, how do you find book printers? So let's let's talk about that kind of all together. So logistics, H- how did mm. we figure those out, guys? Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean... Printers, in terms of how did we find book printers, talking to other publishers was huge. And shout out to my friend Charlie Hurd at uh, CLC Publishing, because I sat down with him one day and was like, okay, so how big are your print runs? And they were about the size that we were thinking of. And I was like, okay, who do you use? And he gave me two or three names of people to reach out to, to start asking questions. Because I had talked with another publisher 
who'd given lots of great insight. But when I asked, you know, when I got down to the nitty gritty of like, how many books do you publish at a time? They were looking at 15,000. And I was like, oh, you're a little bigger than we're, we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, I was like that you're probably not going to be the person I ask for those logistical details. <laughs> how I come up with pricing is a direct, uh, it <clears throat> comes directly from print price, really. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have to look at your print price and, and that is affected by how big of a run you're printing. You know, the fewer books you print, the more it costs per book to print. But then you have to take that, you have to figure in, you know, X percent is going to go to royalties. We need to work in overhead costs there for marketing and what did we pay for our illustrator and all of those things have to be rolled into it. And then, you know, Theoretically, it'd be nice to have some money on top of that, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's an interesting challenge. And I think, you know, the question, is there anything you wish you'd done differently at the start? I don't know that I wish we'd done something differently, but I do wish I at least had gotten a better grasp on how all of those pieces you just listed, Annie Beth, play into the whole picture. I will say a shout out to Mick for helping us develop a spreadsheet Mm -hmm. to lay out our costing structure for each book where we can just plug in numbers for the cost of the cover art or the illustration, the print costs and shipping costs at different um, price points. Like if we get 500 or a thousand copies, um, what does that breakdown look like? And with royalties plugged in, what is our, our base price to break even what can our wholesale price be? And even that spreadsheet, as wonderful as it was at the beginning, has evolved as we've been learning through this process. Right. And we're like, oh, wait, here's another factor we need to work in. Right. And so that has been helpful. I kind of wish we'd had the more complex version on the first book. <laughs> at the beginning. I think, yeah, absolutely. Just two cents. Mick is your husband who yes. is, uh, I, I refer to him as our, you know, our Bandersnatch what's the word I'm looking for? Consultant on call. Um, Yes. (laughs) He's a very useful person to have. He he has a lot of skills and um, an entrepreneurial mind, a very logical, very strategic. And uh, yeah, we, we very much benefit from his skills. Yeah. Illustrations and cover artists in terms of like finding those, that's been a really interesting process because it's happened so many different ways. Rachel, do you want to talk a little to how we found some of those? Yeah. So, I mean, on some of the projects for going on a dragon hunt, Carrie and I both, the first time we read the manuscript, we were like, oh, Johnny would be amazing for this. I wonder if he's available. And we know him. So, you know, we reach out and say, hey, are you interested? But then some of these people are people that we've met through social media. Mm -hmm. Um, The lady who did the cover of my poetry book, Beyond Chittering Cottage, I think I met her through the Hutchmoot homebound groups. Like Mm -hmm. there was a thread and she does a lot of lettering, like hand-drawn lettering and art. And I was just enthralled with her work and said, hey, could we get her (laughs) to to help us with cover design? It was amazing. Her her work is so beautiful. And so that's been really fun, just kind of daydreaming. And then we have, um, I think we've compiled a list somewhere of potential illustrators, potential designers, artists, because we keep meeting really talented people and each book has its own style and that kind of calls for a certain thing. And so you go back to that list and say, okay, of all of these people, like who, whose work kind of has the vibe that we're looking for. And so that's been really fun to reach out and, and work with just amazingly talented people. Yeah, absolutely. Incredibly talented. And those people we've met, you know, through our own interactions just out in the world. And then also some of them have reached out to us and said, Hey, I do this if you'd Mm -hmm. be interested at any point. And so that's, you know, that list uh, continues to grow as people do that. I think it's on our submissions page. There's a little note for illustrators, like to just send us an email with portfolio information and we'll add you to the list and keep you in mind for the future. Okay, so talking more about our process, someone asked, how much of the publishing process are you responsible for, Bandersnatch responsible for, versus the author? And the example they gave was, does the author need to find their own cover designer? Is that something Bandersnatch does? 
we partially answered the second half of that by saying that we have a list of illustrators. True. If you're a picture book writer and you're the author illustrator, that's usually okay. That gets a pass. But if you're not, don't go and have someone make a whole bunch of pictures or even a cover design for your book and bring it with you to submission because the publisher will choose. Please do, from our perspective as a small press, have somebody that you can suggest if you want, but otherwise, no, we we choose. Yeah, well, and, yeah. and one of our picture books was an author illustrator came together. Yes. You know, came as yeah, a pair. That's true. But yeah. one of the things that was so great about working with them was that the illustrator had ideas and she had samples of the direction, but she was not locked in. Yes, the true warning is don't have your illustrations already completed. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So yeah, I would say, you know, the publishing process Um, We function as a traditional publisher in that we manage most of that. We, because we are a small press, really collaborate with our authors in that. And Mm -hmm. I think our authors probably get a lot more say in the process than they would at a larger publisher. But we want we want it to be a team. You know, we want to work with you on on things and anytime we get to work together with you, like that's just going to make the book better. And it's just going to make the process feel more like we all own it. And, you know, mm. if we can all own it, then we can all all have the passion for it that, mm. you know, that it needs to get out in the world. So yeah. another question, uh, how long does it usually take between submission and publication? That is a question that has varied for us uh, fairly significantly Mm -hmm. so far. I will say right this minute, we do not have any open slots before 2026. So we are recording this in early 2024 and we're looking two years out. There have been books that we have picked up and turned around more quickly than that, Mm -hmm. but it tended to be just so happened that we got something that was already really polished and we had a hole (laughs) in our schedule. (laughs) Like it's, it's not that we needed to get it out the door kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And there have been books that we have said manuscript submissions that we have said no to, because we've said this manuscript actually is timely for this moment. And our timeline is too long. Mm -hmm. And we think you should self publish this and get it out into the world now. Mm-hmm. I would say for us, we probably will continue running on at least a two year cycle moving forward, just based on, you know, what we're thinking our timelines will look like. And that is standard to short yeah. for the publishing industry mm-hmm. timeline for for how traditional publishing functions. It's a long process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the whole thing. We got another question about any tips for going into the publishing process for the first time. What would you say to somebody pursuing publishing for the first time? My biggest tip is please polish your manuscript as much as possible before you submit it. Do not rush into the submission process. I would even say if you have the cash, hire an editor to go through it. Beta beta readers are great, but you know, it, it really does make a difference because as Carrie was saying, it takes a long time to publish a book. It's a very involved process. And the more work the publisher has to do on your novel or your book, your picture book, whatever, to get it out there, the less likely they are to publish it. When something comes to us and it's in great shape and all we have to do is fine tune and make it sing, then that's when we're saying, yes, yes, yes. If it's, if it's a great idea, but it's just not quite there yet, and it needs a heavy developmental edit, that's when we're going to say, mm, we probably don't have the time. Yeah. We function real lean here at Bandersnatch. Like, we don't have a big staff. Uh, our, mm-hmm. our staff is basically on this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that includes Sam, who is recording yes, for us. Yes, thank you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I would say be prepared for the answer to be no. So if you get a no on the, you know, your first time out there, don't quit. 
That doesn't mm-hmm. mean that your writing is not worth it. It doesn't mean that the effort is not worth it. Keep going. Not every publisher is going to give feedback. We've tried to make it a practice to, to offer some points of insight of, to help the author understand like why we're saying no, why is it not a good fit? Where might it be a good fit? Or what does this manuscript need? Like, what are you seeing? And so I'd say just, just kind of gird up your loins, be ready. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that is such a huge thing. Like be prepared for the answer to be no. I I think of so many published authors, well-known famous authors with their one, you know, most well-known manuscript had been rejected, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 times. A Wrinkle in Time was rejected by 50 publishers. There you go. Case in point. Exactly. (laughs) And so when you have something good and you Mm -hmm. know it's good, persevere. Mm -hmm. And also be open to feedback if it's not ready yet, because- There's only so far that you can take a manuscript on your own before you get other people looking at it. And so it might be that you, you know, I don't know, it it just depends on what the manuscript is, but. Yeah. And if once you get a yes, I think, you know, into the publishing process, once you get a yes, that doesn't mean your manuscript's finished, <laughs> No, it <does> not. <laughs> you know? And, and I think yeah. that is, that's another thing, like be open to being edited, be open to other eyes on your work and developing your work because the thing is it's probably a fairly blanket statement that a publisher doesn't want a book to fail right right like I think you know when you get to the massive publishers there's ones that sort of they don't put a lot of effort into making them succeed but even those that it's not that they want them to fail you know every publisher wants the book to find an audience as much as the author does. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, recognizing that your editorial team, your creative team, your, you know, visuals, et cetera, they're all aiming for the same thing you are, which Mm -hmm. is to have your book be a success. All right. So we had, we had many, many questions about when we are opening for submissions. (laughs) So Rachel, when are we opening for submissions? I think we are going to have the capacity to open up submissions toward the end of July of this year. And we will be looking for titles that will publish in 2026. Yeah, yeah. I'd say look for it starting middle to the end of July of this year. If you are not on our email list, that's the place to be. We will announce when we open submissions to our email list first. And then we're probably only going to open that window for a couple weeks this time because we have a very limited capacity. (laughs) So yeah, keep an eye out for it. And Annie Beth, we got a couple of questions about when we are opening for picture books. Um, We were not open for picture books this past season in 2023. So what are our thoughts about picture books this year in 2024? We are not going to be open for picture books in 2024. We're sorry. <laughs> oh, I wish we could. Yeah, yeah, we wish we could. And and some of that is just it's the limitation of space in our catalog and in our, you know, our schedule. Picture books are are expensive to make, and so we have to limit how many we can make each year. We will at some point again open for picture books. Yeah. <laughs> that that will happen so keep again email list is a great place to keep your eyes out for that Mm -hmm. Um, so we also had a question about a specific genre um historical middle grade and even particularly historical middle grade with disability representation and would we be interested in something like that i think that sounds real cool i think so too (laughs) with disability representation we've already published books with disability representation so that's definitely a category that we're open to The caveat is that I would personally ask that it be accurate to two things. One, the disability. Mm -hmm. And two, is it going to be accurate to the time periods? So do your research and make sure that anything you're saying about that disability or how it might be treated in that historical time period is accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. great. All right. We are coming toward the end but there's one last thing we must discuss. 
we have a lovely beastie on our <laughs> bander pod and again shout out uh evelyn warnamendi is our artist of the bander pod beastie mm-hmm. and we love him he he has become a dear friend over <laughs> the weeks that we have started this bander pod and early on, uh, Millie Florence, who's the author of The Balter of Ashton Harper, posted and went, he needs a name. And we said, oh, of course yes. he does. And we started a process of getting name nominations from all of you and then narrowing that. And the last couple of weeks, you guys have been voting. So before we get to the, the final, the mm-hmm. winner, um, <clears throat> our voting started with 32. Mm-hmm. We did a little bit of winnowing to get to the 32. Were there any Annie Beth or Rachel that stuck out to you particularly from the get go? I actually tried not to get too attached to any of the names because I knew <laughs> it was going to be selected by not me. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I noticed there were a lot of them that had references to the Jabberwocky poem where the Bandersnatch originally mm-hmm. came from. So you had Mimsy and Tum Tum and Snickersnack. Those are all fun. There was also a, yeah. cl- a grouping of names that are references to the inklings which i thought was a lot of fun so mm-hmm. you had tallers and lewis and jack and clive, jack and clive. <laughs> those are really fun as well but honestly like every time i read through the list i'm kind of drawn toward the alliteration of names mm. um so <laughs> i don't know like i'd i'd be really happy if his name was alliterated but there are also some other really fun names to say. So I don't know. We'll see. see how agreed. Agreed. So I actually, one of my favorites that made it a good long run into all of them was Cuthbert, <laughs> which my nephew suggested. I am not sure why my nephew suggested that. I love it because it feels like such a it distinguished does. name, but then also it's got the Anne of Green Gables <laughs> reference in it. Um, so. What were the final four? Okay, so the final four were Benedict Bartholomew, Brumius B. Snatch, and Bertram, nicknamed Bertie. I think the alliteration definitely <laughs> went went far. Yes, it did. As I was counting up votes today, I actually was, oh my goodness, is there going to be an, an upset? Is it going to be overturned? Because they were so even oh wow however when i did all the math well i say i when google sheets did all the math for me um (laughs) we do have a winner (laughs) and i would like to note that um my friend tim heard made an excellent argument for this one on facebook because he looked at the etymology of the name the name is and this was suggested by our friend kelly keller it is Benedict Bandersnatch. <laughs> yes, so the the etymology comes from bene, Latin for good, and dict, Latin for, you know, dictus or di- I don't know exactly, dictum, um, but word. So uh, good word. Oh. So I mean, for a banderpod beastie, I feel like it's kind it's of amazing. Yeah. Um, oh, I love it. it also has the added benefit of referencing Benedict Cumberbatch because no <laughs> one can pronounce his name. And Benedict Bandersnatch is definitely on the list of things yes. that people have mispronounced. So I'm up for that. I love it. I feel like oh, he would look good it. in it's our perfect. Beastie's hat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he would. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone definitely. ever needs to play the Bandersnatch Beastie? He has... <laughs> He yeah. can be a bandersnatch. But Benedict is our beastie. Yay! Hey. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and for being supporters of Bandersnatch Books. And we hope that you find bookish treasures in your wanderings off the beaten path. Thanks for listening in to our conversation today on the Banderpod. We hope you'll check out our full catalog at bandersnatchbooks.com. The Banderpod is produced by Rachel S. Donahue, A.B. Donahue, and Carolyn Claire Gibbons. Audio engineering by S.D.G. Morgan. 
artwork by Evelyn Warnemendy. Many thanks to our friend Chris Slayton of Son of Laughter for our theme song, Cricket in a Jar. Find links and more in the show notes.